The title of the lesson is called Outcast. Now, I might be dating myself. Do any of you remember a singing group called the Outcasts? Oh, yeah. So back in the 2000s, there was Big Boy and there was Andre 3000. And they were this hip-hop duo called Outcast, and it was spelled with a K. And they had a song called Hey Ya. It was probably one of their more famous songs. And I thought about having Justin play that song as I came up here, and I thought, well, that would be a little irreverent. The one reason why I like that song, I mean, it's a little racy. It was talking about dancing and stuff like that. And so they were encouraging those who were involved in dancing to shake it like a Polaroid picture. Do you remember that? That's why I like that song, because I thought nobody remembered Polaroid pictures, you know, getting spit out of the camera, and then you have to shake it to let it do what it did and get you the picture. So, anyways, today's message is about outcasts, but it's not about Big Boy or Andre 3000. It's taken from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, and then continue on to verses 11 and 12. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, you know, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And when reading this last or third parable of what I refer to as Jesus' lost trilogies in Luke 15, we tend to concentrate, I think, on the flight and the return of the younger brother, you know, the prodigal son. And not necessarily wrong, I think, if we limit the parable to such a narrow view of just the return of the prodigal son, I think we miss a good portion of what Jesus is expressing in these parables. In the parable, there are two brothers, as you know, each of whom represents a different way to be alienated from God and a different way to seek acceptance into his kingdom of heaven. And the setting that Luke provides for Jesus' teaching, I think, is very crucial to the parable's understanding. Because in the first two verses, Luke tells us about two groups of people who have come to listen to Jesus. The first were the tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus, I believe, used this group of men and women to correspond to the younger brother in the parable that he tells them about. These folks observed neither moral laws, nor the Bible, nor the rules for ceremonial purity that were followed by the religious faithful of their day. As the parable goes on to suggest, they engaged in wild living, and like the younger brother, they had literally left home by leaving the traditional morality of their families and of their society. The older brother in the parable was represented by the second group of listeners, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. This group held to the traditional morality of their upbringing. They studied, they obeyed the scripture, they worshiped faithfully, and they prayed constantly. And with great economy, Luke shows how very different each group's response was to Jesus. The progressive tense of the Greek verb translated, we're all gathering, conveys this notion that the attraction of the younger brother types to Jesus was an ongoing pattern in his ministry. In other words, what Luke was suggesting to us as readers is that this phenomena of younger brother types were always following after Jesus. It wasn't just this one event that Luke is trying to capture for us. This was like part of Jesus' ministry. They continually flocked to him. And this phenomenon puzzled and angered the moral 
and the religious types, and Luke succinctly summarizes their complaint. This man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. That's what bothered the Pharisees and the teachers and the religious leaders. This man welcomes sinners, thereby excluding themselves, of course, and then has the temerity to sit down and eat with them. Now, to the religious, this was a huge moral no-no. Because to sit down and eat with someone in at least the ancient Near East conveyed some level of acceptance. And in fact, during Jesus' time, many of the food that was being eaten by people was shared around a table. So to sit down with sinners and eat with them gave the appearance that Jesus accepted these people and to the more the religious types, they could not fathom how Jesus could accept somebody like that. In other words, the religious were saying, how dare Jesus reach out to those people? Why, they don't even come to church. Why would you want to associate with them? So while many of us gravitate toward Jesus' teaching about the prodigal, it's the second group the scribes and the Pharisees, that I believe are really the object of Jesus' teaching. And it's their response to Jesus and the expression of their religious attitudes that Jesus uses to then share this parable. Now, a parable is, the best way I can define it, a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. In other words, Jesus was not saying, hey, I know this, this kid down the street, yeah, he got all of his money from his folks on his inheritance and went to Sin City and blew it all. And it, Jesus is not saying that. It's not anybody he knew. He was telling them a story, a heavenly story with an earthly meaning. And so Jesus uses the juxtaposition of the sinners and the Pharisees as the mechanism to give this parable. And the parable of the two sons takes an extended look, I think, into the soul of the older brother. And it then climaxes with a powerful, powerful plea by the father to change his heart. Throughout the centuries, the preaching of this text has almost always exclusively focused on how the father freely receives his penitent younger son. And you can even imagine Jesus' original listeners, their eyes are welling with tears as they hear how God will always welcome and always love them, no matter what they've done. But we over sentimentalize that particular parable if that's our only takeaway from the parable. The target of the story are not wayward sinners, but religious people who do everything that the Bible requires. Jesus is pleading not so much with immoral outsiders as he is pleading with moral insiders because he wants to show them their blindness and their narrowness and their self-righteousness and how these things are destroying not only their own souls, but the lives of the very people around them. It's a mistake, at least in my opinion, to think that Jesus tells this story only to assure the younger brother types of his unconditional love. It's highly unlikely that the original listeners were melted to tears by this story. It's more likely that they were thunderstruck or offended and maybe even just a little infuriated 
Because Jesus' purpose was not to warm their hearts, but it was to shatter their categories. Through this parable, Jesus challenges what nearly everyone else has ever thought about God, about sin, and about salvation. Jesus' story reveals not only the destructive self-centeredness of the younger brother, which is true, but it condemns the elder brother's moralistic life in the strongest possible terms. Jesus is saying that both the irreligious and the religious are spiritually lost and that those different life paths are dead ends and that every thought the human race has had about how to connect with God has been wrong. And despite the passage of some 2,000 years since the giving of this parable, older brothers and younger brothers are still among us. They live in our society. Sometimes they live in our own family. And not to overgeneralize, but the oldest sibling in a family is often the parent pleaser, the responsible one, you know, who obeys the parental standards. I thought this was kind of an interesting slide. So the, the young lad there on the left, the moment he realized he was now the middle child, look at that look on his face. So, again, not to overgeneralize, but it seems to me that more often than not, the eldest child in a family is the one who's generally pretty responsible and obeys parental standards. The younger sibling tends to be maybe a little bit more rebellious, a free spirit who prefers the company and admiration of his or her peers. The first child grows up, takes a conventional job, and settles down near mom and dad. The younger sibling, on the other hand, goes off to live in the hip, shabby neighborhoods of, let's say, Hollywood or New York City. These natural temperamental differences have been accentuated in more recent times. For instance, in the early 19th century, industrialization gave rise to a new middle class. It was called the bourgeois, which sought legitimacy through an ethic of really hard work and moral rectitude. In response to this perceived bourgeois hypocrisy and rigidity, communities of then bohemians arose kind of like the indie rock scene of the 70s. Bohemians stressed freedom from convention and personal autonomy. And look around you, it's no different today. To some degree, the so-called culture wars are playing out these same conflicting temperaments and impulses, even today. More and more people consider themselves non-religious or even anti-religious. They believe that moral issues are highly complex and they are extremely suspicious of any individual or any institution that claims moral authority over their lives or over the lives of others despite, or perhaps because, of the rise of this secular spirit, there's also been a growth in today's conservative, orthodox religious movements. And alarmed by what they perceive as an onslaught of moral relativism, many have organized the Take Back the Culture movement and take a dim view of these younger brother types, the Bohemians. They view them like the younger brother, just like the Pharisees did. So whose side is Jesus on? 
in Lord of the Rings when the hobbits asked the ancient tree beard this same question, whose side is he on? Here is Treebeard's answer. I am not altogether on anybody's side because nobody is altogether on my side. But there are some things, of course, whose side I'm altogether not on. That was Treebeard's answer. Jesus' answer to this question through the parable is similar. He is on the side of neither the irreligious, nor is he on the side of the religious. But he singles out religious moralism as a particularly deadly spiritual condition. It's hard for us to realize this today, but when Christianity first came to prominence, it was not called religion. It wasn't. It was the non-religion. So let me just give you an idea. Imagine the early Christians, and they are engaged in a conversation with their neighbors, and their neighbors ask them about their faith. And the first question is, well, where is your temple, they would ask you. And the Christians would reply, well, we don't have a temple. Okay, but how can that be? Where do you priests work? And the Christians would have replied that we don't have any priests. But, 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 but the neighbors would have sputtered, where, where are your sacrifices to your gods? And the Christians would have responded that they didn't make sacrifices anymore. Jesus himself was the temple to end all temples. Jesus was the priest to end all priests. And Jesus' sacrifice was the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. And no one at that time had heard anything even close to that. So in an effort to find a label for this new religious movement, the Romans called them atheists. Did you know that? Christians were called atheists by the Romans because it didn't fit the Roman idea of what a theist looks like. No temple, no priests, no sacrifice. We're nothing like any religion I know, so you must be not that religion. So you're not a theist, you're an atheist. Because what the Christians were saying about spiritual reality was unique and couldn't be categorized. It couldn't be categorized, at least with other religions of the world. And Jesus' parable explains why they were absolutely right to call them atheists. And the irony of this should not be lost on us. Standing as we do in the middle of modern culture wars. To most people in our society, Christianity is religion and it is moralism. The only alternative to it, besides some other world religion, is pluralistic secularism. But from the beginning, it wasn't that way. Christianity was recognized as something else entirely. The crucial point here is that, in general, religiously observant people were offended by Jesus. But those estranged from religious and moral observance were intrigued and attracted to him. We see this throughout the New Testament in various accounts of Jesus' life. In every case, in every case where Jesus meets a religious person and a sexual outcast, you can find that in Luke chapter 7, or with a religious person and a racial outcast, you can see that in John chapters 3 and 4, or a religious person and a political outcast, you can find that in Luke chapter 19. The outcast is the one who connects with Jesus, and the elder brother type just simply doesn't. In fact, Jesus said to the very respectable religious leaders of his day, In Matthew chapter 21, verse 31, 
the tax collectors and the prostitutes will enter the kingdom before you. Jesus didn't make any friends in saying that to the religious types. Jesus' teaching consistently attracted the irreligious while offending the Bible-believing religious people of his day. And tragically, our churches today do not have that kind of effect. The kind of outsiders that Jesus attracted are not attracted to contemporary churches, not even those churches that are really avant-garde, that got all the bells and the whistles and the production value. They're not even attracted by that. We tend to draw conservative, button-down, moralistic kind of people. The licentious, the liberated, or the broken and the marginal They avoid church, which I think can only mean one thing. If the preaching of our ministers and the practices of our members do not have the same effect on people that Jesus' teaching did, then we must not be declaring the same message that Jesus did if our churches aren't appealing to the younger brother types, maybe it's because we're populated by more older brothers than we'd like to think. So the question that Jesus poses is, which one are you? And his answer is, be neither. He doesn't want you to be irreverent and living your life in licentiousness and sin. But he doesn't want you to be this holier-than-thou, Bible-thumping, religious person that's beating up on the others because you think you're better than they are. Jesus said he came for everyone. And really, what we know is, as Paul said, we are all sinners. There's nobody in this audience today. There's nobody in the world with whom we work every day that's better than you, that's worse than you. Paul said, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Later on, he says, and the wages of sin is what? Death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus, his son. So this parable, I've preached it several times to this church. It's one that I wrestle with because I think it's kind of like looking at an aquarium. Have you ever been to like the Birch Aquarium or maybe the aquarium up in Monterey? I mean, it's these monolithic (laughs) aquariums and they're like, you know, 15, 20 feet deep. And the thing about an aquarium is You can look at the surface and just see the stuff that's happening at the surface, the flotsam and the jetsam and maybe some of these little fish. And then you look down a little deeper, and then you see maybe bigger fish. And you look down even deeper, and you see, wow, there's a really a lot of big fish. And you look down at the very bottom, and there's stuff like crawling on the rocks. So for me, sometimes reading God's word is where I'm at in relation to this aquarium. I'm either looking at this level or this level or this level, and many times it's because of experiences in my life that draw me to that. That's my experience in reading God's word. How many times have you read a particular passage, and it's like, yeah, I've, you know, John 3.16, let's use that one. How many times have you read John 3.16? You can probably quote John 3.16. But have you ever had that experience when you're reading God's word and you know you've read this passage a million times before and all of a sudden it just pops off the page like, I didn't even know that was in there. Well, of course you did. You've read it a hundred times. But because of some experience in your life and the Holy Spirit moving in your life, now all of a sudden it becomes relevant. And we are going through a period in our history as a nation in which we are seeing very different viewpoints of God very different viewpoints of religion, very different viewpoints of morals, and very, very different viewpoints of truth. 
Let us not be the religious types that are sermonizing and preaching to those that really need to hear the truth. Don't be the older brother. Don't be the younger brother either. Be the dad in that story. He accepted them both. Do you remember what the father said to the elder son? That was the end of the story. And that's where we want to be. We want to be at the end of that story. And we have a father that loves us that way. Now, can we reflect that to others with whom we come into contact? That's the challenge. And I think we can if we see the heart of the father in that story. And if we take on that kind of characteristic and that kind of attitude as we share with others, then we become attractive to people who are looking for the truth. It's a huge challenge, but it is a challenge nonetheless, and we are ripe to start having an impact in our society on that basis. So my encouragement to each of you is just be real. Don't be preachy. Don't get involved in all their stuff thinking, well, I have to identify with them, so I'm going to have to wallow with them. No, I'm not suggesting that either. But be available. Maybe live your life in such a way that you are demonstrating something that they find attractive. I don't know. Each of you have your own personal contacts with people that I cannot be involved in. All I can tell you is my experiences. And many times, you know, your life is the only sermon that many people will ever hear. So live a life that is reflective of the Father for those two boys. He loved them both, received them both back, realized they had their strengths. And through that story, we see that perhaps our strength is not being in preachy, but it's being real and helpful and loving.